And a big hello to everybody out there at Calaville at the workshop today. It's Graeme Anderson here from Agriculture Victoria. My sincere apologies for not being able to be there in person, but I'm just involved in, in East Gippsland uh, this week. So, um, but I have recorded um, a bit of a slideshow here, which will hopefully be useful for understanding uh, long-term weather and rainfall history for your district. So I'd just like to point out our um, seasonal risk team. Some of them might know some of the products. We've got the break newsletter Dale Gray puts together and soil moisture probe stuff that Dale Boyd does. We also run a, a whole bunch of um, regular webinars on climate. We probably speak at 140 forums a year. Um, so a lot going on in that space. But if you want to see some of those products and learn a bit more about some of the other web tools we've got and posters, um, just head to that website. So first up, I'd just like to give a bit of a plug to the Climate app. Um, there's the website there, and you can have it on your mobile phone or desktop. It's a really good app. You can see all of these little dots here are long-term rainfall records. And I've just um, got it for uh, Colourville here. And um, it looks at the long-term record, and you can do things like check the how's the season's progress. So I've just done it from January last year. The blue line here is long-term average. All of these individual lines are uh, individual years in history. And then the red line is what actually happened um, in the last uh, 13 months. And so you can sort of see there, dry start last year, had a pretty good growing season, and then things tailed off there uh, in the spring. So really good tool, highly recommend it. And also on the uh, climate app, you can also query things like how often at Calaville have we had more than 50 mil of rainfall over a 14 day period, um, you know, in the months of March to May. So it'll tell you what's happened in the past, which is often a really useful thing. You know, we might be anticipating good autumn breaks and things, but there's nothing like just doing the query about, well, how often has this happened in the past? And here's just a, a map of looking at uh, 2019 um, for the for the rainfall for the year and how it compared to history, seeing decile. So this is this colour de designates where they got average rainfall. Decile one is where rainfall was in the equivalent to the driest 10% of years. Decile 10 where rain was equivalent to the wettest 10% of years. But you can see um, largely a lot of Victoria was drier. Um, some average areas down south. Decile one up in um, your part and also have a look at how much of Australia had its driest year on record. That was pretty remarkable. So here we've got a long-term record, rainfall record for Prairie um, and Calaville Composite. So this goes back to 1887 here, right through to 2019. And you can see on the left here, that's 200 millimetres and here's 600 millimetres. And the long-term average, if you put a line through all of that, was 381 mils. So you can see there's been some pretty wet years in the past, pretty dry years, a lot of variability in the system. Um, you can see those two dry years, the last two, we'll talk about those there. But the Indian Ocean Dipoles um, had two years in a row where it's been in its dry phase, so it's um, got its fingerprints over that. In 2016, the Indian Ocean Dipole was in its wetter phase, so you can see that there. In 2010-11, we had a lot of extra moisture around with both um, La Nina's in the Pacific and, and a wet phase of Indian Ocean Dipole. So we'll talk about how some of these climate drivers have influenced these wetter and dry years. And here's that rainfall record for Calaville again, but it's got summer, it's just split into season. So summer rainfall in the long-term record, autumn and winter and spring. So you can see there's a lot of variability that's right throughout all of that. Probably there's a few more dry winters thrown in um, in, the, in the last 20. And also if you probably look at um, some of those springs, certainly in the last 10 you, you've, uh, that apart from 2016, most have been a bit drier. Now, where does all of that moisture come from to make rain? So to make rain, you've got to have moisture. And this is one really key image. It's showing pre precipitable water across the planet. And what you'll notice is that most of that moisture is along the equator where the oceans are warmest. It's where a lot of the cloud is. And so seasonal forecasters watch these areas like a hawk um, in the Pacific Ocean and the oceans to our north and the Indian Ocean. And some years of pattern set up where all of that moisture is somewhere else on the planet. And it's, uh, it's hard to get that moisture feeding into weather patterns. And then some years it's all sitting around it. So that's really at the heart of seasonal um, forecasting is keeping tabs on where is most of the moisture um, lining up this year. Um, this is a great little map you can see here uh, in southeastern Australia and here's Antarctica. Um, but key drivers behind a wetter and drier year. So we've got the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Some years 
Um, there's lots of moisture coming uh, from that, and especially in La Nina years. So 2010 and 11 is a famous one with lots of moisture barreling into us. Um, the Indian Ocean Dipole, it's, it, it also has wetter or drier years, and um, sometimes these two can team up. So 2010, 11, they were both in their wetter phase, um, and uh, uh, say 2015, they were both in their drier phase. So they can team up. And you can see these cold fronts whizzing around the Southern Ocean. That's driven by uh, the Southern Annular Mode. Really important triggers for rainfall in Southern uh, uh, Southern Australia. So you need a, a wetter years when we've got more moisture floating around our part of the world, but also plenty of triggers to make it fall out. So they're really, uh, they're the key drivers that a lot of the forecasts are, are tracking. Okay, now here I've got a rainfall record from a bit further away from you, but up at Kerrang, but it's a pretty good indicator for what drives regional rainfall in your part of the world. This is from a new tool, local climate tool that we've got on uh, Forecast for Profit website, but it basically goes through um, the last 120 years of rainfall, but it's color coded depending on which climate driver was actually active um, in any particular year. And um, what's really interesting, if you look at some of those really drier years in your part of the world, it's where an El Nino teamed up with a positive Indian Ocean Dipole. So that's when the, the Indian Ocean's in its dry phase. So when both those oceans are in a dry phase, they're our bigger droughts. And you can see here just those last two years are, are uh, Indian Ocean Dipole positive, so the dry years. So you can see that uh, wetter year 2016 with the Indian Ocean in its wetter phase, the 2010-11 are when both the um, Pacific and Indian Oceans were um, firing up with a bit of extra moisture. So it's um, not a bad site to go and look at to um, look at how things have affected you in the past. And of course, that then leads into seasonal forecast because what it is is how that what are those climate drivers doing this year? Yeah, so a key question is, well, how do these climate drivers affect our upper catchments, which are pretty important for irrigators? So when we head up at um, look at the Mid Mid River in the upper catchments, and we're looking at that sort of August and November um, flows in catchments, um, and then we're looking at what's happened in the past when there's been El Nino years. Normally you expect a third of years to be in the red dry, a third are average and a third are wetter. But you can really see how El Nino's doubles the chance of those low runoff years. And the same when the IOD is in its dry phase. And those higher runoff years um, increase chance of them when we've got either a La Nina happening um, or the Indian Ocean Dipole uh, in a sweater phase dragging in extra moisture. So there's a probably an amplified uh, uh, influence of those climate drivers on your catchment. So that's why they're worth paying attention to. So there's a bit going on in the forecasting world. I'm just going to share a few products here. And this is about understanding seasonal forecasts. And there's a forewarned for our product, which is um, working on better products for farmers. Now I'll just talk about uh, a little bit about interpreting seasonal forecasts. So here's the bureaus and they've put out their now multi-week and um, seasonal forecast, which looks at say the next three months. And here and you'll see some of these maps. So we'll just talk a little bit about making sure we're understanding forecasts. So here's an example of the current forecast that the Bureau's got for the next three months for March to May. This was issued on the 13th of February. You can see these sort of maps and, you know, they give a probability of above or below uh, the chance of exceeding median rainfall. So you can see here, um, you know, looking at this area here, a 40% chance of exceeding median rainfall. So, um, but that's also meaning a 6% chance of, of less than average rainfall. But there's a little bit more devil in the detail. So basically the same data runs. So imagine that if they've run the forecast, they've looked at sea surface temperatures and where the cloud is and they've run the models for the next three months. And out of 100 model runs, this is sort of what's happening. Um, this is sort of showing the spread of the model runs for March, April, May for so, somewhere like Shepparton, not too far away. So you can see that Decile 1-2, 21 of the models landed there, 33 of the models landed in Decile 3-4, uh, 19 of the models landed in Decile 5-6, and, and only 10 of the models landed in uh, Decile 9-10. So it sort of gives you an example. That's that's basically, it's the same forecast, but it's just a different way of explaining it. And so often even, a, and a key is sometimes you might see a forecast where it says 50% chance of above or below median. A lot of people say, oh, that just means average. Um, actually, it doesn't quite mean average. It means uh, often that there's as much chance of Decile 1 as there is of Decile 10. So just important that 
when we're reading these seasonal forecasts, we understand what they are saying and what they're not. Um, just for comparison, if we look back at these forecasts in September 2019, there were 51% of, of the model runs were landing in Decile 1, 2. So, you know, some years is a much stronger signal than others. At the moment, it's um, it's all looking, um, you know, it's a bit, bit unpredictable what will happen, which is often the case in autumn. Now for a one-stop shop of making sense of forecasts, the fast break newsletter that Dale Gray puts out with AgVic is a ripper. Um, basically each month he puts his out, he looks at not just the Bureau's seasonal outlook, but he looks at the outlooks from the US, um, the UK, Europe, Korea, um, Japan, all of their seasonal forecast models, and he puts them on this graph and basically looks at Victoria and says, how many are thinking average, how many are thinking wetter, how many are thinking drier? So this is the current one he's just looked at. You see there's eight there sitting on average and there's four there sitting on the drier side of the fence. So um, it's a really good, simple way of getting a bit of a heads up of what's going. It's interesting, if you look at um, last spring, um, we actually had uh, for a couple of the months, um, all of the models that he looked at had us on the drier side of the fence. So some years is a much stronger signal than others. So what I've talked about is a lot of variability. Now I'm just going to cover, is there anything different to long-term natural variability? So now here we've got maximum temperature deciles from 1910 going through each decade of the, the last 100 years. And you can see um, blue is cooler than average years and yellow is warmer than average years and orange is warmest on record. So you can see there's a lot of temperature variability there in a history, but you might notice there a bit of a trend in recent decades. So that was predicted. There's extra heat being trapped in our atmosphere because of greenhouse gases. Um, we're at the start of a warming trend that's going to continue for many decades. So while rainfall variability will continue, we're basically in a process of squeezing in an extra month or two or summer. So that's something that is a bit different to just normal variability. Yeah, and here you can see this is for southeast Australia, uh, maximum temperatures for summer, uh, for autumn, winter and spring. So they've all got increasing trends. There's still quite a bit of variability around there. And so milder winters can be probably helpful for pasture growth. Um, but this one, you can see spring in the last 10 springs has been um, quite a few between one, two and almost three degrees warmer than average. So that's summer turning up a month earlier. So that's what's a bit different to just normal variability. Now, another thing that's a bit different is just the pressure pattern over southern Australia, this region here. So you can see since 1950 up to recently, pressure varies from one year to the next, which is variability. But what's been happening is we've been having a, an increasing pressure trend. And what that does is it just squeezes out the odd bit of rainfall in some of those years. Now, that's a trend that's expected to continue in future, which is why we're expecting to uh, have some dry years thrown at us in future. And I would just like to have a bit of a chat about the difference between weather forecasts and seasonal forecasts and climate change projections and where we're more confident and where we aren't. Weather forecasts basically go out to eight to 10 days. They're called deterministic forecasts and they'll predict what the weather's gonna be like on a particular day, um, temperatures, you know, what rain you might expect, wind and all of that. Um, so they're all good. Just be aware that there's different models and sometimes for some weather events, there's um, the models don't all agree. So sometimes that's important to know when they're more confident and when they're not. So to get more than one opinion. Also know that um, when you that while they can forecast thunderstormy weather on a particular day, they've got no idea where actual individual storm cells might start. That um, that only happens uh, an hour or two before. So so you know sometimes with our rainfall we can get a lot in those thunderstorm events, but they're not quite um, as predictable a few days out. Um, it's important to um, seasonal forecasts, what's sort of happening with them is, you know, depending on how oceans and cloud patterns are set up, they run the models for the next three months and they give you these probabilistic forecasts. No one actually knows what's going to happen, but sometimes um, those weather patterns can be really heavily skewed, especially in years when there's a really strong climate driver. Um, away. So some years seasonal forecasts offer a lot more value than other years. So, and if anyone's telling you they know what's going to happen in the next three months, then they're pulling your leg. So, so just um, be wary of that. Uh, also with climate change projections, there's, um, there's a lot of confidence around those trends of increasing heat. There's an increasing temperature because there's increasing heat being trapped in the air atmosphere. Um, and that's 90% um, of that heat's going into oceans. So that's something we're going to see a lot more of. What happens is um, basically as things get hotter along the equator, uh, we see a poleward shift of weather patterns. So for our part of the world, we, we see weather patterns sort of shifting south. So there's high degree of confidence around that, but there's a lot of um, uncertainties, especially around how it will affect some of these key drivers of our variability.
I'll also just point out too, there's um, this website, there's some, some good uh, local climate guides that the Bureau of Meteorology just put out. They're little four page fact sheets on looking at uh, weather in the last 30 years. So there's some, I'd recommend them to have a look at just to look at some of the local trends. So just some more resources and tools. Um, Rob will point you to this one, uh, Extension Oz, got a really good website. And uh, you'll see lots of stuff there, like where the weekly irrigation requirements, all that stuff. You're probably already getting that, but just, just making sure you know about it. They're really good resources. So no matter what happens uh, in the future, I mean, weather's that we've got seasonal variability and climate change in the mix. So that's gonna give us plenty of challenges with dealing with a um, bit more variability and plus some um, increasing in incidence of drier and warmer. But um, uh, but I guess there's a lot of things that are in our favor and this is a lot of the things that are being applied across farms in all districts. Um, and we've got modern tech, R&D, genetics, innovations, all things that can really help us do things more efficiently and do them better than we have before. And um, also there's been a heck of a lot of great work on improved on-farm and regional infrastructure around um, you know, water and um, fodder and how we better deal with that, um, very increasing variability. So there's plenty more we'll, we'll be needing to do there. There's a lot of work we've got to do on biosecurity and really important because that work enables us to keep access to global export markets. And, um, and while they're growing, um, the biosecurity is a really key platform for keeping them open. This is probably a really important one though with increasing with the, um, business volatility from year to year. It's not just the weather, but also with market volatility, that has a really big impact on businesses. So um, getting good skills and financial skills around how you handle that variability is really important. And often some of the most um, valuable things um, that are done on farms for setting them up for longer term future is around what happens in the good years and what you invest in that actually helps you ride out the, the tougher years better. Um, a lot of great work happening with farm planning and um, setting up um, the health of our farms a lot better. And the important thing, which is why you're there today is, um, you know, learning, sharing information with other people, make sure you're tapping into good knowledge and turn, turning up workshops like that. And they're all the things that, um, that help you make sense of a changing world and confidence to invest and, and make, th make you better off in future. Anyway, I hope that uh, has been useful. If you need any more information, just drop us an email or head to the website and all the best for the rest of your workshop.